Okay, so hi everyone, and thank you for inviting us to come and talk about plant calls. Um, my name is Marav Vonchak. I'm an ecologist and more specifically an entomologist. I'm also a California uh, naturalist, and I've been involved in community science in the past uh, 12 years. About six years ago, I started organizing BioBlitz events, and later it became the BioBlitz Club. Uh, hopefully, you heard about us and maybe joined one of our events. Uh, it's mostly in the South Bay. Uh, I also manage a few other community science programs, and I teach natural history. Okay, Michael. Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Hawk. I'm uh, based in San Jose. I'm also a California naturalist. Uh, I came to become a naturalist from a maybe non-traditional path. I, uh, my career has traditionally been in engineering. Uh, but uh, in recent years, I've been focused on nature almost 100%. So uh, my path really started with uh, hiking, leading to birding, and now it's kind of everything. So I'm not a expert in plant galls, uh, but it's something I've taken a great interest in and have uh, worked hard to learn a lot about. And I love to share, which is why I'm here today. Uh, some of you may know me from, I've been active in a number of different groups in the South Bay. And I also have a podcast called Nature's Archive. So uh, Marav, back to you to get us kicked off. Okay, thanks. So let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen okay. I guess you can. Looks um, good. Okay, thanks. Now I know. Um, okay, so just like Michael said, I'm also not an expert in plant calls, but I like them a lot. And uh, I learned a lot about plant calls when I organized the first BioBlitz event uh, six years ago and I'm just fascinated by these little weird things you can find on plants and I think this is a really good place to present about galls because I'm guessing you're interested in plants and often in other organisms that are closely as associated with these plants and for me as an entomologist this is a really good way to learn about plants and i learned so many plants because of my interest in goals so hopefully by the end of this presentation you'll be interested as well okay so this these are the different topics we're going to talk about what are goals how are they formed which organisms uh, induce goals how to find them is it a goal or not a goal uh, documenting goals on iNaturalist and Spring Goal Week, which is an event that we're going to have in April. Okay, so what are goals? Uh, you probably notice all these weird structures you see on plants, uh, like these apples on valley oaks, but of course, oaks don't grow apples, they grow acorns. So what does all these things you could find on trees and often they could have more of these apples than their acorns. Uh, so these are called California gall wasps. These are little structures that basically host uh, tiny little wasps uh, and serve as their home uh, on these trees. But uh, there are many different kinds of uh, galls. They could be very colorful and pretty and very diverse in general. So let's talk a little bit more about what they are. So galls are structured growth of uh, plant tissue, and they are produced by the plant host in response to a mechanical or chemical stimulation. They are, oops, uh, they are induced by the adult or larva of an insect or mite, or by uh, a fungus. The mechanism varies according to plant and gall inducer. The galls are formed on leaves, stems, petiole or branches, and also on buds, flowers, seeds, roots and fruits, so different parts of the plant. And there are different common types of galls. So for example, stem galls could be detachable or integral stem galls. When we look at leaf galls, they could be a leaf roll or a leaf fold. Uh, there could be also a pouch gall, bead gall, uranium gall, different kind of types that just help us categorize them. And when we look at the host plant, uh, you could see looking at this list that some 
host plants uh, have far more um, gall species on them compared to others. Oaks, for example, have a very high number of uh, species, as you can see here. And that's why we'll focus a little bit on oaks, but we'll also talk about the other hosts as well. Um, and this list can help you when you try and look for galls, and Michael will talk about that later. This is taken from the wonderful book by Russo uh, that came out a couple of years ago. I highly recommend it. Gall inducers are uh, species specific. Some of them are highly species specific, or sometimes you could find the same gall species on very closely related um, uh, species of plants. For example, when we look at all these uh, beautiful galls we can find on oaks in the South Bay, for example, uh, and probably in the North Bay as well, or in the peninsula, uh, you can see the ones in red are found on coast live oak. The ones in blue are found on valley oak. In green are blue oak galls, and in purple on scrub oak. In yellow, or orange, or whatever that is, these are galls on canyon live oak. But we can categorize the oaks. Of course, these are all they, all the oaks belong to the same genus, Quercus. But uh, since it's such a large genus, some of them are more closely related to others. You probably know that we have the black oaks, white oaks, and intermediate oaks. Uh, but the gall inducers know that as well. And different oak species in the same uh, category, black oaks, for example, could share some of their gall species. White oaks can share some of their gall species. And the same with intermediate uh, oaks. So, for example, all the ones with green now uh, can somewhat move between different host plants. So we can find some of these uh, gall species on more than one oak, as long as they're closely related. And that's how I learned my oaks. And I could tell you which oak belongs to which group, which I'm very proud of, because I found that very confusing before I started looking at galls. But when you look at the galls, it, it all makes sense, because now I know which species I find on which hosts. Um, and when we look at the gall inducing organisms, you can see that there are different groups. So we have the uh, fungi, the three different families, mites, aphids, moth, um, gall midges, sawflies, gall wasps, beetles, and fruit flies. And I'll uh, focus on most of these groups in the next few slides. So when we look at mites, mites are tiny arachnids closely related to ticks. Uh, but these are not your regular mite. You might have noticed mites on plants. These are very tiny arachnids that kind of move around. Usually they'll have eight legs and move kind of quickly on plant material or on soil. These are microscopical mites and they only have two pairs of uh, legs, as you can see here in the photo, uh, and they have this elongated body base. You can only see them under a microscope. They induce uh, these little blisters on the leaves. Uh, you can see that these galls look somewhat similar on uh, different plants, uh, and each one is induced by a different species, as listed below. Uh, we don't know much about them, so it is estimated that we only know about 10% of the species are known to science. So plenty to study here. Uh, and they are spread by wind, which I think is interesting. The next group is the aphids. So you probably know aphids because you're interested in plants. Um, most of the aphids are free living, but some of them uh, can induce galls, like this uh, species on cottonwood. And I especially like this one, as an entomologist, uh, since I study ants, uh, I was very interested to find these uh, aphids. Uh, and you could see that at some point, the gall, this is on the petiole of the um, cottonwood tree, uh, Fremont cottonwood. At some point, the gall will open a little slit that where ants and aphids can go in and out of the gall. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, okay. The next group is the moth. So there are three different families of moth that can induce galls. Uh, the galls are induced by the lava itself. And most of them are pretty simple. They're like a leaf bulb, uh, looking like a taco or um, a wrapped candy. 
Uh, others induce uh, stem gall, like this very common one on coyote brush. And our next group is the gall midges. So this is a very large group of gall inducers with more than 6,000 species worldwide and over 1,100 species in North America. Um, they develop after the larva start feeding on the gall. And I'll explain why this is uh, important and interesting in a, a couple of slides from now. Uh, not all the species in this family induce galls. Others, other species might be inquilines or predators, so they have other roles in, in the gull, and I'll explain that as well later. Uh, you could see that the gulls are pretty diverse. They don't look alike. Uh, there are many different structures. Some of them look really interesting, uh, and they use a wide diversity of host plants as well. Uh, so flies are primitive wasps, and you could see that their larva looks kind of like a caterpillar but they have more uh, legs, um, but not the real legs. Anyway, um, some sawfly species induce galls, like this common species that we see on uh, willows in the Bay Area. This is called the willow apple gall. And this species is uh, a bit uh, unique in the fact that it can uh, have up to six generations a year. Most of these uh, uh, galls have just one generation a year. And in this case, the gull will only develop, uh, sorry, the gull will start developing after the female wasp uh, lays its egg on the plant, which means that if something happens to the larva, the gull would still develop since uh, the female laying its egg is the one inducing the gull. Um, so you might find an empty gull, for example. Okay, uh, the next group I'm going to uh, talk about is the gull wasp, the cynipedes, and I'm going to focus on this group a little bit because I find it very interesting. Uh, there are over 800 species in North America. Most of them develop on oaks and some others on uh, other plant in, on plants in the rose family, like rose. Uh, the gull is induced in this case by the developing larva. And this is interesting because the gull won't develop uh, if something happens to the egg. And it might look a bit different if something happens to the larva, since the larva is the one inducing the gull. Uh, and I'll get back to this point in a couple of minutes. Uh, they induce complex uh, galls with multiple layers. Um, and they also ha they always have an internal chamber. So when you open the gall, you could tell sometimes who induced the gall, even if you don't see the lava, uh, just by looking at the structure of the, the internal structure of the gall. And they can have one or many chambers in each gall. So depending on the species, they could have one or more lava inside. And we think that we only know about 75% of the species in, in the Bay Area. So there's still so many different species that we don't know of. Some of them we actually do know. We could tell you that, oh, this species, yes, we always find it on this specific host plant, but it's not a described species. Uh, we still need a scientist to sit down and uh, rear uh, the wasps and or the other gall inducers and uh, describe them in a scientific paper. So again, plenty to discover. Okay. Uh, some of these species have alternate generations, which makes it even more interesting. Oh, and by the way, uh, on the right side of the screen, you can see the wasp. This is the adult wasp. It's about two millimeter um, in length. And so these are pretty small wasps. They, most of them look kind of like this, little brownish wasps. It's not your yellow jacket that will come out of the gall and sting you. They don't do anything. They're only interested in their galls. So no need to worry at all. Um, okay, so what are alternate uh, generations? We have, in some of these species, have two different generations. The fall generation starts in the summer or the fall, and it has to survive the winter. And inside, it will have the a unisexual generation, only females. Uh, afterwards, we'll have the spring generation, 
which has uh, good growing conditions because it's spring. Therefore, uh, they develop very fast and they are short-lived. Uh, inside the galls, we will have bisexual or sexual generation, which has males and females inside. And this is true for some of the species. There are some species that we actually don't know much about their biology. Um, so this is true for some, some of the species. An interesting thing about the alternate generation uh, is that some species, uh, some of the galls look different, and even the uh, female wasps look different, which I think is really interesting and might explain why it was so difficult to tell which gall goes with, which ge fall generation goes with which spring generation, for example, because the wasps don't look alike. Uh, it could also be on different parts of the plant. And I know that this might be a little bit confusing, so let me explain it again using this diagram. So we are here, okay? Uh, around this time of the year, the female wasps start emerging from the fall generation, okay? Uh, this is uh, uh, an apple gall on coast live oak. It's pretty common. Once you learn how to find them, these are not colorful, or the galls on coast live oaks are not as colorful, colorful as the ones on valley oak, but once you learn how to find them, they're pretty common and really uh, fun to look for. Uh, so uh, about this time of the year, uh, the wasp will start emerging. And uh, since there are only females in there, they don't need to find a mate, <clears throat> which is great because maybe some of these gulls didn't survive the winter, excuse me. And then, <clears throat> sorry. Okay. No. That was okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm recovering from a cold. So, um, okay. So it's uh, a good strategy that they don't need to look for a mate because after the winter, some of the gods might be gone. Uh, female wasps will uh, find the right part of the plant and lay eggs for the uh, spring generation. Okay. So they will lay the eggs in this case on the leaf. This was a stem gall and here this will be a leaf gall. Uh, inside, they will have a bisexual uh, generation, which means there will be males and females that will quickly develop inside the gall and emerge from the gall, uh, meet each other and mate. The adult wasp live for a very short time uh, where they just mate and lay their eggs and, and they're done. They don't even feed, they don't need anything else. Um, and then we keep going. Okay. But the gall inducing wasp is not alone. Uh, since it's such a great, rich resource, other organisms learn how to use it uh, to take advantage of that. So there are predators that would try and get the lava from inside the galls. For example, you can see uh, woodpecker holes on these apple galls on uh, valley oak. But inside the gall, there might be other insects. Uh, we often find inquilines, which are usually closely related species of wasps that move into an existing gall. So they cannot induce the gall themselves, but uh, they just move in. They're usually vegetarians, so they usually don't kill the host, but they just form their own little chamber inside. So in this case, this is a gall that we opened and you can see the main uh, lava here. This is the one that induced the gall. And this is the inquilin. So it's kind of like a roommate you never invited in, but you have to share the space with. You might also find parasites. So some uh, other species of wasp will lay their eggs directly into the host larva. And their larva, their own larva, would feed on um, the existing larva that was in that gall. And remember what I mentioned earlier that the wasp gall, the, these galls are induced by the lava. So if something happens to the lava, if something ate it or just, you know, took some of the space or maybe add, added some chemicals into this mixture, the gall might look different. Okay. In general, galls are pretty easy to ID. If you try to identify insects, they're often difficult to ID to species. But galls are 
usually pretty easy unless something happened. So this one on the left, this is the red cone gall wasp, which is one of our most common uh, galls in the Bay Area on valley oaks and sometimes on other oaks. Uh, this is also a red cone gall, both, both these. And you can see that they look very different. Probably something happened in there. There might have been uh, a parasite or an inquilin or something else happened to the larva that was in there. And that's why the gall looks slightly different. Same in this case. This is a spine turban gall wasp, which is one of my favorite species. They're so cute. Uh, and usually they look like this, but sometimes they might look like that or, or different than that, depending on what happened to the larva inside. Uh, and if you go out the right time of the year, uh, for example, in the fall, you could see a whole bunch of different um, wasps trying to take advantage of these galls. So these are all different wasps that didn't induce the gall, but are trying to add their babies into the mixture. And you can see this very large uh, ovipositor. So this is how the wasp is trying to lay its egg into this gall, probably to parasitize the larva inside. So it needs to lay its egg directly on the larva inside the gall. Um, okay, but they're not completely defenseless. Uh, to, I'll just give one example. So some gall species like this really cool honeydew gall wasp, um, they can not only make the host plant create a shelter for them and provide all their food and all their needs, but they also make the plant uh, secrete honeydew, which is just sugar water, basically. Um, honeydew is attractive to ants, like these Argentine ants in the photo, but also yellow jackets and other wasps. So uh, once a plant gets covered with uh, honeydew, uh, you'll see constant activity of ants and wasps and other organisms, and this might interfere with uh, parasitic wasps or other wasps that are trying to lay their eggs into that gall. So that's a useful mechanism. Okay, and with that, I will stop sharing so that Michael could start sharing the screen. Okay, thank you, Mirav. And is that, uh, is that viewable? It is. All right, thank you. Yeah, and in that uh, ant interaction, there was a question in chat that, that we covered with the aphids, um, the aphid galls and the ants. And I believe it's a similar relationship where the ants are attracted to the honeydew that's being produced by uh, the aphids in the aphid gall. Is that, uh, is that accurate, Marav? And, and the, then there's a symbiotic uh, protection that happens? Um, just a second, let me read that question. Um, yeah, so ants protect aphids and we see that interaction in many different places. Most ants can, most ant species can use honeydew. Uh, many of them will protect the aphids from their natural enemies like wasps and other things. Uh, so that's about free living aphids. But uh, similarly, we, we find that sometimes with the ones that uh, induce galls as well. Right. So when you find uh, an aphid outbreak, it's not uncommon to find ants, even if it's a gall inducing aphid. So it's kind of a similar situation. So, okay, this has all been really cool, I think, anyway. Um, the fact that we have these insects that are modifying the genetic expression of the plants to create these structures just blows my mind but it's not just the wasps and the insects that do this fungi can as well so we're going to take a moment to look at some of the fungi gallers uh, there's actually evidence that uh, in the fossil record anyway that fungi induced galls have existed for 200 million years and that's earlier than the first insect gall fossils that have been found to date so as is often the case, it appears that fungi figured this out first. There are three major groups of fungi inducers that we're going to briefly cover here, and I have examples of them. Uh, there's a uh, exobacidium fungi named that because the spores are actually produced on the host plant surface. Uh, there's rust fungi and sac fungi, which are those leaf curl galls in the lower right. There's, you know, 
presumably other types of fungi that can produce galls as well. Uh, you know, as, as you're probably well aware, everything in biology seems to have an exception somewhere. Uh, for example, there's a powdery mildew that can cause a witch's broom that some people consider to be a gall. Um, there's probably other ones as well. But let's take a closer look here at the coyote brush rust. And by the way, despite its name, this is another galler that can affect other species, um, other um, uh, species in the same genus. So I think it's pretty amazing to look at this up close. And we're actually entering the uh, time of the year where, we'll, where we will start to see this out in the wild. And it looks like here the fungi is bursting out of the stem and it begs the question, how, how is this happening? So gall induced fungi, they have similar biology to other, excuse me. Um, yeah, uh, gall inducing fungi have similar biology to other parasitic fungi. They need spores to reproduce. Uh, they need the proper conditions to germinate and they sprout tiny thread like hyphae that grow into mycelia. And if we take a look here, you can see some of those features and you can see the morphology of the stem is actually changing by this gall. It's thickening. So you can sometimes see old, ver you know, old um, instances of this by just a thickened stem on the coyote brush. But again, how does the fungi gain such an integral foothold? You know, unlike insects, it's not inserting eggs into the plant tissue. And the short answer is never underestimate the power of mycelia. They're actually very strong and they can penetrate the hosts, even healthy ones. Um, now there is some documentation out there that says that wounded plants may be more susceptible, at least at the location of the wounds, but like everything, there are uh, variations on this theme. So let's take a look at another interesting fungal gall. I found this on um, a toyon leaf actually, and uh, you know, obviously it's a very common plant here in the Bay Area. And this skull for scope, you can actually see a little bit of my thumb in the lower left, but it's about one and a half centimeters wide. And um, this is believed to be, uh, it's called a gymnosporangium fungi. It's a type of rust, believe it or not. And I think it's super cool because those spikes coming out, they're actually spore tubes. And it reminds me of one of those Play-Doh Fun Factory toys that you may have seen, like, in, you know, they still exist actually. I was gonna say in the eighties, but they're still around today where you push down and the Play-Doh kind of extrudes out in these little tubes. Um, now this genus had never been documented on a Toyon before. So that's why I said, we think it's a gymnosporangium. Uh, and that's just, again, based on the morphology. So this is a case of, um, you know, a discovery that can be made and it happens all the time. We'll talk about a few more uh, where we're connecting the dots in species, finding them in new places or finding new species altogether. So we've been showing a lot of really colorful, colorful galls with nice close-ups, um, but not all galls are that clear to see and they can sometimes be hard to find. So, you know, I guess that begs the question, how do you find galls? Um, so what I, you know, you could kind of glibly say, well, just look closely, but that's not super helpful. So for me, what I actually have to do is consciously change my attentional filter when I'm looking at a plant. And as you know, Marav was talking about, you can find galls on different structures on the plant, on stems, on leaves, um, on flowers, on acorns, whatever the case might be. So I'll, I'll sometimes just reset my uh, attentional filter to say, okay, I'm going to look at the leaves now. Now I'm going to look at the stems and I'll scan the plant and I'll look for anything that stands out. But that technique aside, you might be wondering, you know, really where to look, what's the next level here. And, you know, there's two ways to approach it. Starting with the plants. If you have that Russo guide that, uh, that, that book that Marav held up earlier, and we'll link to that later as well. You can see exactly, you know, you can see photos of what galls occur on which plants, and that can give you an idea. Uh, you know, vice versa, if you're just looking at a plant, it can be still fun to investigate it, even if you don't know what the galls are. And we'll talk about how to do that here in a moment. Now, using the example of starting with the plants, though, we've talked a bit about coyote brush, and here are four examples. There's actually more that you can find on coyote brush, but uh, four examples of galls that, uh, that we've talked about that you could see uh, and just by looking at the one plant. 
So these are the plants that we tend to focus on. Uh, some of the most common galls though, that you may most often see don't occur in any of these plants that we've listed here. So I wanted to point out like, don't only focus on this list. And a really good example that I'm sure many of you have seen is on manzanitas. Sometimes on the margins of the manzanitas, you get these little red puffy things as seen here on the right. And that's another aphid that has uh, created the galls. Uh, that's a very common one that uh, we'll start seeing here in a little while. And there's probably old ones out there that look dark brown at this stage as they age. And here's another good example. It's a midge gall that you'll find on ethereal spear. And interesting thing about this, I've seen patches of ethereal spear where almost every single one has this thickening of the stem. And if you didn't know better, you would think that's just the normal growth pattern of this plant. So uh, it can be very profuse uh, in certain situations. Galls can be found uh, all year. There was a question in the chat earlier about, you know, when, when are they um, being produced? And really the, the production of the galls correlates with when the plant is growing, the phenology of the plant. These, uh, you know, the, the insect inducers anyway, are looking um, to take advantage of plant growth, modifying that genetic expression to rapidly create the structure that they can reproduce in. Up here in the Bay Area, I think late summer and early fall is probably the peak time. We get some of our showiest galls that time of the year, but spring, lots of galls occur in the spring as well, which is why we're having gall week here uh, that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so other times of the year though, may present opportunities such as in the winter, if a plant has lost its leaves, some of those integral stem galls may be more easily seen. And some galls actually, uh, even the leaf galls will be more likely to hang on to, uh, to the tree for longer. Um, I'm thinking of um, the, some of the leaf roseate galls, for example, you may still, still see. Similarly, when leaves fall off the trees, it gives you an opportunity to inspect those leaves up close that you may not normally be able to see because they're just frankly too high up in the air. So uh, fall can be a good time to look at some of the leaf litter and see what you can find. So this graph here uh, that we're showing, this is pulled from iNaturalist from the Galls of North America project. And you can see those trends a little bit. There's some skewing of the data that we'll talk about here. Um, and I didn't try to normalize this, say for like observation hours or, or things like that. Uh, but you can roughly see things pick up in the spring and, and peak in late summer and fall. Now those peaks in late summer and fall are exaggerated just a little bit here in the last two years because of gall week. Um, so uh, Marav, this was Marav's brainchild and it really took off. We'll talk more about it later, but we have more observations largely because of the extra focus that Gall Week brought to this subject. So there are so many undiscovered and undescribed galls that I think it's always worth looking at a plant through those different lenses that I was talking about a moment ago. Look for abnormal things. Um, even though I call them abnormal, they may occur uh, in abundance on a given plant. So it's just things maybe you hadn't noticed before don't look quite right. Scan the leaves, the twigs, the fruits, the flowers. Now, some of the pictures we've been showing you are uh, galls that you may not see this time of year. Uh, Marav has a wonderful handout. This is a selection of some of the galls that are in that handout that she has. Um, and I believe that there's a link to it later that, that we'll talk about. So you can actually go and download it from the BioBlitz Club website. But here's a few examples of some of the galls that you can find in the spring. Now, if you are looking for abnormal things on plants, you know, trying to find a gall, inevitably you'll run into a situation where you aren't quite sure, is this thing that we're looking at a gall or not a gall? And there are several attributes to check and make note of. So some of these attributes we've already discussed, but we're gonna go through some practical examples here and, and put it to the test basically. So some things to consider, where is it growing? As we talked about, certain insects will take advantage of very specific um, elements of the plant, you know, like a leaf or a fruit or a flower or a stem. Um, and you can, uh, you can build correlations about that. 
is the item attached? Most galls are going to be attached, though some are only very loosely attached. So they may still fall off very easily if you touch it. Uh, but there would usually be some evidence of the point of origin, though, even if the gall did fall off when you touched it. Does it look different from other growth? So that seems pretty self-explanatory, but I think we all run into like, you know, aborted acorns or things like that that just don't look quite right. Um, so what you can do is if you see something that looks different from other growth, you can look around on the plant in similar placements and see if you see it in a repeated pattern, maybe look at a neighboring plant and see what conclusions you can draw. Um, you know, you, could, you can compare these structures and, and get a rough idea. Do you see exit holes? So there's insects inside of here, and especially for the, for the wasp galls, the cynipid galls, uh, those are, you know, even though they're only a couple millimeters big, they, it's still big enough that you can see a little hole where the um, larva would have come out as an, you know, as an adult or sometimes before, uh, you know, pupating. But nonetheless, you could see a hole. And um, if, if you're looking at an older gall, you might actually decide to cut it open and look inside and see, does it have a chamber? What's the structure inside? If it has a chamber, it's probably a cynipid gall. So this picture here, I'm gonna ask you, think about it. What do you think based on what I just said? Is this a gall or not a gall? And as a hint, I'll tell you it was on a coast live oak. And I'm gonna try to see if I can find where the chat is and see what people say. So feel free to put your answer in. If you don't wanna answer, I'll, I'll just tell you. But uh, this one, it's actually not a gall. So despite the placement here on the leaf margin, uh, it looks you know, like where a gall might occur. Um, this wasn't attached. I know you can't tell that from the photo, but it fell right off. Uh, it was very moist too. So uh, as you heard earlier, most galls don't produce all of this liquid. They may secrete a little bit of honeydew, but not you know, to, to this level usually. Um, it was very likely part of a um, a berry or something else that fell from another plant onto the leaf. So we'll go through a few more of these. So this one here, it's a twisted leaf. When I touched it, it felt pretty solid to me, pretty sturdy. So I'll give you a, a couple seconds to think about that. I see somebody say, yes, it's a gall. And yes. It is a gall. It's one of those cosmic moths that we talked about a little bit ago. And it's pretty cool that in this case, the structure, it actually, you know, made the, the leaf grow in this uh, kind of folded up structure. All right. So here's a leaf fold on a coast live oak. Is this a gall? I think if you really look closely, you could probably figure this one out. Hopefully the resolution is coming through well enough. All right, I'm not seeing any guesses in chat. Oh, I see no moth, another no. You you all are good. It's not a gall. And uh, if you look really closely there, you see there's some silk that uh, is attaching and it actually mechanically folded over this leaf. And uh, when <laughs> curiosity got the best of me, I actually looked inside and this, there was a spider in there. So this was made by a spider. Okay, this is another one where I think if the resolution is coming through, you might be able to figure it out, but I'll tell you a little bit about it. I, when I touched it, it was solid, it was hard. And if the video resolution isn't that great, this may give it away. If you look real, real closely, you could see, somebody says bird poop, good guess. Um, you can see little bubbles in there actually. And this is actually not a gall. It's, it's old, desiccated, dried out spittle bug foam, which, uh, yeah, somebody just said that. Um, so it actually gets surprisingly solid, you know, when it's been there for a while. And uh, it was an interesting discovery. I'd never really taken the time to investigate it until I got interested in galls. And, you know, now I know. So I apologize 
this is not a native plant, <laughs> but uh, I think it's a good example. So sometimes older galls don't look their best and uh, you can have spider webs or even fungi can grow on galls. There are certain like parasitic fungi that only attack galls, which is super cool. Uh, this was seen on a eucalyptus and uh, I'll give you a little hint here. These little structures were very brittle and thin and they easily fell off when I, uh, when I touched it. So I'll give you a moment to think about that one. Yeah, I, there's another not a gall guess, and that's correct. This is a honeydew excretion from the red gum lerp psyllid, and it forms kind of this shelter over the insect, uh, which is a, a cool thing, but not a gall. So this here is big thing is on an oak tree trunk. And uh, actually, I, I don't see the photo credit here. This is a public domain photo. It's not my photo. Good one. Somebody said burl. That's exactly right. It is a burl. So burls are different from galls in a number of different ways. Uh, they can form from an injury or stress or even a fungal infection. There's some things that really aren't known, you know, all about burls, but unlike galls, they don't serve any kind of reproductive purpose for whatever the triggering mechanism was. And you can find burls on uh, many different kinds of trees. California Bay is where I tend to see them a lot. I'm sure all of you being uh, plant people uh, probably can picture some burls that you've encountered. We have just a couple more gall or not a gall. I think, um, I think this is fun. I hope you're enjoying it. This here is a seed from a shrub in the Spurge family. And you can see some things here. You know, it's structured. There's seems to be uh, an exit hole. You may know it as a Mexican jumping bean. Maybe some of you now know what the answer is. I see gall, gall-like, insect casings. Yeah, this points out how difficult it can sometimes be, but this is actually not a gall. Uh, so the moths that create these um, jumping beans, they lay their eggs when the shrub is really immature, when the seed pods are immature and the eggs hatch and the tiny larvae bore into the pods and they hang out there as the seed matures and um, they use it as part of their life cycle and eventually exit. So uh, it's another interesting strategy, but it's not a gall. It's actually not modifying the genetic expression in the plant. Now, I really like this example. It was found on a great uh, gall host, a canyon live oak. It's kind of hard to see where it is there. It's it's where the two leaves are um, sprouting out from a stem. I think I've lost track of the answers here. I, I think somebody just said not a gall. I think that's related to this one. And correct again. So this is actually a scale insect, which are super cool. Um, I did a really deep dive into this family. They're called gall-like scale insects. You can't even really see any part of the insect here. This is just like this big blob that looks just like a gall. Um, and uh, there are a number of uh, gall-like scale insects out there that can really uh, trick somebody. Oh, I, I lied. There's, uh, there's one more here. Um, so <laughs> this was an interesting structure that was found on a scrub oak. Uh, over at Lexington Reservoir. I see one gall guest, guess. Lots of gall guesses. And you're exactly right. So this is, it's actually an acorn gall. And I know it doesn't really look like an acorn, but the galler takes advantage of the, um, of the plant tissue that would have grown into an acorn. It's an undescribed species of galler. So what that means is, um, you know, entomologists know this thing exists, 
They know that it's created by an insect. They know it's a galler, but nobody has reared one and then done the deep taxonomical look defined and documented the structures to identify, you know, with a name and, um, uh, and details what it actually was that created this. There are a lot of such galls out there. When you look at the Russo book, for example, there'll be a lot of these undescribed gall species that they've given a label to, but we don't really know for sure which insect created it. And maybe it's an insect that's never been described before. Uh, so a lot of interesting things out there to discover. And building off of that, um, we've very likely been overlooking lots of galls for a very long time. And I have a bunch of examples that uh, are personal to me that um, demonstrate this point. And I think Marav has examples personal to her and, and a lot of us who've gotten into galls have such examples. So this one here, it's an undescribed midge gall that occurs on um, Frangula californica or California coffee berry. And despite being undescribed and kind of hard to find, it's not, not the most difficult, but it's not common. Um, this gall it was actually really prevalent on my backyard coffee berry. And I get a lot of them. So I decided for science to take a look at the inside of one. So I opened it up and confirmed. You can see a bunch of little larvae in there. It's, it's midge larvae that uh, are inside of here. So the fact that I found this undescribed species was kind of cool. And um, I uh, didn't know enough at the time as to how to rear these. So if I get more this year, I'll give it a shot and, and see then if I can help progress our knowledge. But by looking at my backyard coffee berry, I found this fruit gall that as far as, um, as we could tell when I posted it on iNaturalist, nobody had ever reported before. It didn't exist in the literature. But after I reported it on iNaturalist and got, um, some feedback and some people interested, it started being found. And in fact, I think it was found on San Bruno Mountain, in fact, among other places. So uh, once people start looking, you know, once you're aware of what to look for, they just kind of come out of the woodwork. So yeah, um, this is just more, this is me submitting it to iNaturalist. You can see I, I put a whole bunch of photos in there and generated a discussion. And before long, um, people were looking. So one more discovery, and I threw this one in kind of last minute because it's very fresh. It's just from a few weeks ago. So in mid-February, I noticed a bunch of these American winter ants on a coast live oak bud. And as you probably learned from what we were talking about, that is a telltale sign of honeydew. Why would there be honeydew? Well, maybe it's a gall. So that was my thought process. So knowing these ants aren't generally attracted, I started looking very closely at the plant. I found other instances of this thing and went, turned around, reported it on the iNaturalist, engaged some of the gall community. And um, I was asked if there were enough of these to collect a sample to confirm, because it looked like a gall that had never been photographed before and only was known in the literature from something like 1912, or I don't quote me on the date, but over a hundred years ago. And sure enough, I um, cut one open and there was a larva inside. So this is believed to be a uh, Cococinips attractans. Uh, it's uh, another cynipid syn wasp. And ag yet again, after reporting this, people started reinvestigating some of the assumptions they had made in past observations. And it seems like that this has been seen a few times. And um, I'm trying to rear one of these right now. I think it's unsuccessful. Um, I, it's been like 10 days and nothing has emerged yet, but I'm gonna keep at it <laughs> and hopefully, Hopefully we can put this mystery to rest. So I'm assuming that most of you have used iNaturalist in some form, or at least are aware of it. If not, real quickly, it's an app that allows you to document observations and um, contribute to community science. It supports all types of living organisms. So um, you name it, you can put it on there. And it will actually, using a machine learning algorithm, suggest identifications based on the photos that you submit. And the accuracy of that is getting better all the time. But even if you don't trust the machine learning suggestions, there's a whole community that is associated with many taxa on iNaturalist and Gauls in particular have a very fervid community. 
So my suggestions, if you want to uh, get into Gauls is definitely document them on iNaturalist, submit multiple photos and include the host plant. Um, as we've talked about, there's this specialist relationship that often exists and the host plant is very important to um, have in, in the mix. Um, you can and should put the host species name in your observation in iNaturalist. There are also some special projects dedicated to galls, and this can help you get more visibility. There are some people that will periodically go and look at the unidentified galls in these projects and try to help identify them. And there are annotation fields. So if you really want to do this well, there's this evidence of presence field, and you can flag it as a gall as well. And other annotations include the host IDs. So you can uh, you can flag that. So it becomes searchable. People really doing research, the, the science side of the community science, they'll thank you for going through the extra effort of doing this. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Marav to talk about Gall Week. Yeah, thanks. So I, I just want to say quickly that we had two wonderful uh, Go Week events. The first one was in 2021. Um, again, I just wanted to raise awareness to these little known um, organisms. Uh, as we mentioned throughout this presentation, there are still so many species that we don't know anything about, uh, other species that we know a little about and still need to be described. And this is a great opportunity to get more awareness to this organism, to get so many people to document them from around the world. We had thousands of people, uh, thousands of observations made by um, a couple of hundreds of people from many different countries. So we had two different fall events. Uh, this is the second one um, that was just last fall. And this year we'll also have a spring event uh, in the middle of April for about a week where we'd like to encourage people to go out and document uh, goals and enjoy them in general, but also document them if you can, uh, so that other people could see them and that we could use that for our studies. Um, so yeah, we'll share all the links later. Uh, I want to quickly share my website with you, Bioblitz Club, where you could find uh, different resources, including these two different uh, golf flyers. There's one for the uh, fall uh, species that you could see and one for the spring species. And of course, this is just, these are just very few species of what we can find here. If you want to get a full list, you should get the book. But um, this is a good place to start because again, goals are somewhat easy to ID in general and are really fun. Uh, you could also see the different events that we have and for the next slide yeah these are some of the resources we'd like to share with you we'll hopefully send a list of resources at the end of the presentation uh, but we'd like to recommend a couple of books that you can see here in addition to Gulf Forward's website which is a, an incredible resource that keeps improving with time but already is a wonderful resource uh, on Michael's uh, podcast, uh, you could listen to two different episodes about goals, and there'll be a new one coming out very soon. Um, and again, Bible's Club, you could see different things. I also like to take uh, to thank Paul Heipel and Sarah Witt that maybe some of you know that helped create the original presentation. Um, and for our last slide, yeah, we just wanted to share some of our contacts with you. Uh, in case you'd like to connect with us. Uh, so these are websites and social media and everything else. And thank you. And I'm just gonna jump in and um, add on for for me, uh, my email address there. I um, the, the podcast that uh, Marav mentioned, I actually interviewed Marav. So if you wanna hear more of Marav's voice, you can find that one uh, talking about bio blitzes. And then, uh, as she said, there is a new golf podcast coming out in a few days. And, um, I, I hope that I can convince some of you to take a look at my new conservation organization that is in the early stages called jumpstart nature at jumpstartnature.com. Um, we're just getting started. Uh, we have a few volunteers on board and we're working on, uh, really taking a message forward of, um, 
catalyzing and empowering people to make a difference for the environment in ways that are meaningful for them using new media um, and combining that with uh, behavioral science to really just empower people, help people um, get over whatever is holding them back from helping the environment. So with that, uh, I think we can turn back to the questions and see what we've missed. Hey, thanks so much. That is really exciting work you all are doing. Nice. I'm just, I'm jazzed to go out and look for golf now. Yeah. So there's a bunch of good questions in here. Uh, they're sort of like peppered throughout the uh, the chat conversation, and there's a couple in the Q and A. Do you have a few minutes for that? Yeah, sure. Certainly. Yeah, I, I see one that I'd like to answer. So there's a question about the relationship between galls and plant health, uh, and as far as I know, unless the plant is in really bad shape, usually it's not a problem. Uh, you could see hundreds if not more galls on one oak uh, and the oak seems fine there could be many different species of galls at the same time on one oak uh, so unless the tree is in really bad shape or the plant is in bad shape usually the galls are not a huge toll on it but um, that's as far as i know i've actually i've asked that question of, of some people as well uh, that uh, have been involved in in research, and it seems like yeah, there's not real, um, there's no evidence that it's negative, except in a couple very rare cases, like Marav talked about. And the interesting thing I wanted to add on to that is some of these folks have actually gone so far to say that uh, the healthier the tree, the more likely it is that you'll see galls on it. So that it's mysterious and it's conjecture, um, but uh, it's an interesting thought, and I hope someday that that uh, this, these mysteries will be able to be solved. I do think they add to, you know, the beauty of these plants. So, but that's my opinion. <laughs> um, I see another question about uh, photography. Michael, would you like to talk about that? Or should I start and you can add more? Oh, wow. Well, I think there's... both of us really enjoy um, taking photos of different things. So. When we go on bioblitzes, we document everything, the birds, the bugs, the plants, everything we see. And we often enjoy just going and looking for galls and, and things like that. Um, and we use different things. I think we use similar equipment, right? So we both have um, real cameras with macro lenses and fancy flashes and stuff. Uh, to take photos, but I often take most of my photos using my, my cell phone. I have this uh, macro lenses at the back. Um, yeah, I have two different macro lenses and I take most of my photos with that. But when I want to take better photos, I use my real camera. Do you want to add stuff? Yeah, um, I, I think you hit a lot of it. So I'm very similar to Marav. The challenge I often have on a bio blitz is I wanna take pictures of faraway birds and then insects that are up close. So I'll carry uh, a macro lens for my camera, or excuse me, for my phone as well. It's a different style. Um, I'll try to hold it up here. I don't know if it will be visible, but it screws on to the case for my phone. Um, it doesn't give the same quality, of course, as an SLR. So I, I have a DSLR and you could use a mirrorless camera as well with a macro lens. And I think that would give you the best quality. Uh, a flash is very helpful. So a flash designed for macro use up close uh, will, uh, will be very helpful as well. And then the other little trick, if you don't wanna jump into cameras with interchangeable lenses, a lot of naturalists like the Olympus Tough TG6 camera, and there's, there's an older version, the TG5, which is also really, really good. Um, you can literally drop this thing and get it wet and uh, kind of abuse it out in the field and it will continue to work. And it has uh, really good macro capabilities on it too. So it, that's a really nice compromise uh, for someone not looking to jump in super deep with a uh, um, interchangeable lens camera. Great, that's helpful. So uh, Jeffrey asked uh, a while ago and uh, noted that a lot of the galls seem to be are red. And does that seem to be they're advertising their toxicity to potential predators or is there any 
you know, uh, hypotheses on that relationship of color? Mm, I, I have no idea. I haven't actually, as obvious as that question seems right now, I haven't thought about that uh, before. Uh, Marav, do you have any insights? So I, I answered somewhere uh, that I think it might be because many of the gulls are rich with tannins, so they're not edible for, for many creatures, um, which might actually be a good thing for the plant, right? Because if some herbivores are trying to feed on the plant and it tastes even worse than it was before, then maybe it's actually an advantage, advantage for the plant. But yeah, I don't know. That's that's one guess that I have. That yeah. and nice, nice note. Anyway, yeah, yeah, Thanks definitely. There, huh? Good question. So, um, someone else is uh, asking if uh, galls develop on lichens. Not that I know. Um, right? Yeah, I have not heard of that. Yeah, just on plants, but maybe the. You know, it's also a bit subjective, right? We, this is what how we define galls, structures on plants. So, so I think yeah, that might be a good quick aside because I know Marav and I were talking about this before. That, like, you know, just like species, like that's an arbitrary boundary between what's one species and another species. Um, defining a gall, it's an arbitrary boundary. It's a label that we've come up with. So you may actually find in some literature slightly different definitions than than the one that we've given here. But um, I, I really like the definition of uh, structured plant growth that services the reproduc reproductive cycle of another organism. So that's what I stick with. Cool. And one and there's a, if you don't mind one more, but it's two questions really that uh, are sort of interrelated. Sandy's asking why are oaks host to so many species? And of course, you know, we sort of know the bigger question that is just coevolution. But uh, also, uh, Bob had asked earlier, does it seem like there's a lot more prevalency of, of uh, our galls on native species? or are they also uh, n noted often on non-native species? Can I take a first stab at that, Marav? Sure, yes. I, I, I like the oak question because you could almost also say, why are uh, cynipid wasps such prolific gall producers? Because if you were to get rid of the uh, cynipid wasps, oaks wouldn't really stand out all that much anymore. Um, so to, to your point, um, it, it is seemingly a co-evolutionary thing. Now, then the next question is why, like, why did this um, genus of trees and family of wasps come come to this conclusion? And uh, yeah, very hard to, to say what, why that might be. But it is interesting to note that oaks support a very disproportionate proportionate number of insects at different stages of their life cycle beyond galls. So different herbivory strategies uh, are extremely prevalent on oaks. So there is something about oaks, uh, you know, that perhaps it's their, um, their evolutionary age and diversity and the fact that so many exist in many, many different uh, parts of the world. And you start tracing that back. I'm just conjecturing here, but you start tracing that back uh, and um, and you can, you can understand why this may have happened, but there are other examples where it hasn't happened too. So, right. um, you know, yeah. it's hard to say, but, uh, anyway, Marav, what would you like to add? Yeah, so I agree. And, and just want to add that we have a very high diversity of oaks in California, which probably adds to the high diversity of, of the gall wasps. But, uh, regarding the non-native species, I think that's a really interesting question and, Often, this is part of the problem with invasive species, uh, like the Argentines we saw earlier as well, that when we move these or help move these species from one place to another, usually they don't move with their natural predators or parasites or any associated species. So that, that's why they can become such a big problem, because there's nothing that could limit their spread. Uh, I mean some of the native species can 
eat uh, non-native species, but in general, a non-native plant has less interaction with uh, native species. And especially when we talk about gulls, they are so species specific that I wouldn't expect any of our native insects to be able to induce gall on a non-native plant. Sometimes we do see that uh, non-native plants arrive, or maybe later there's uh, a gall inducer that will arrive. So we do see galls on eucalyptus trees, on um, pepper tree, for example, on some of my garden plants, uh, some of the non-native garden plants, they might have uh, galls as well, like box plant. Um, what else? There's a whole bunch of non-native plants that have galls, but in general, we don't see that too often. So we're not seeing much crossover. That's a good thing. <laughs> uh, yes and no. I mean, maybe we want to get rid of some of these non-native plants. And <laughs> yeah. the insects that do seem to cross over, it's not good a lot of times. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. I, I was going to comment, if you if you dig into iNaturalist, the most commonly observed gall is on an invasive plant. Um, I think it's the, the Canadian thistle, um, which we don't get out here as far as I know. I think it's more of a Midwestern and Eastern thing. Uh, but uh, it, it's one of these situations where it's an invasive plant and the galler was brought along with it. Mm. So the insect that's, that's the galler is also technically invasive as well. Mm. Uh, it's all very complicated and fascinating. Yeah, that's a great question. I think we should add a slide to the presentation about that. that that's a really good point. Well, Marav and Michael, thank you so much for that. That was an absolutely fascinating presentation. And there are many thanks in the chat and we'll save those and uh, share them with you later. So uh, thanks again for being here and, and to the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, bye, thank us. you so much. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. We'll yeah. see you again and hope to see you all out there on the trail sometime soon. All right. Thank you. Good thank night, you. Bye-bye.